Hey there, my friend, Adam here. And today I wanna to walk you through 10 marketing tips and tactics and strategies, or rather give you a framework and a playbook that you can use to create marketing that works, that converts, that's profitable and helps you grow your business or any business you're working on. What this is going to help you do is essentially anytime that you're sitting down and you're thinking of ways to generate new customers or more leads or make more sales or launch a new campaign, it's gonna give you a framework and a roadmap that you can follow from start all the way to finish to make sure that you're doing the right things in the right place for the right people, rather than just randomly guessing and hoping and praying that this might all just magically work, which let's be honest, isn't much better than gambling. And that makes no sense at all, especially when there is a far more proven and strategic path that you can follow, one that has been replicated thousands, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, both for myself and for my clients over the past 10 years, and one that I know that if you follow and you work through, what I'm about to share with you will have amazing and positive effects on your business and your marketing as well. So with that said, let's dive right in. Now, what you're looking at right here is the original kind of brainchild behind all of this. Just a, a mess of, of words and of thoughts and ideas all kind of tossed down on the paper. Of course, in typical Adam fashion, being slightly a bit of a perfectionist, still working on it. Anyway, I cleaned it up a little bit. I made a better and cleaner diagram for you. And that's what I wanna walk you through here today, essentially starting in the middle and then working our way out. See, the problem is when most people think about marketing they think about business planning and strategy and things like that. They view it as this linear path. Like I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do that and then it's gonna be followed by this. When the reality is it's often a lot more of this kind of roller coaster ride. We're gonna try this, we're gonna get data and feedback, we're gonna look at the analytics and the metrics, we're gonna pivot and adjust accordingly, then we're gonna go in this direction, then we're gonna move this, then we're gonna base those decisions off everything we've just done and what worked and what didn't, and it continually evolves and you need to be able to evolve and adapt with it. All that said, there there is a set of steps that you want to take. You don't want to just go out there and start posting on random social media accounts because then nothing's going to work. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get burned out. And then you might just give up on the whole thing altogether. And that's not good for you. It's not good for the people that you hope to serve. It's not good for anyone. So the very first thing that you need to do anytime you're launching a new campaign, whether it's an existing business or you're thinking of starting a new business is you need to start right in the center here with the offer. Now, I could make you struggle to understand my terrible handwriting like was mocked up the time before, but I've taken the effort to go and let's see if this works. I don't have perforated paper, but that worked better than I thought. So here we are. Step number one is the offer. Now there's a bit of a debate in the marketing community about when it comes to starting a business, when it comes to growing an existing business, do you focus on the offer first or the target market? In other words, do you want to make something and then find people to sell it to, or do you want to find people that you can help and then make something to solve their problems? No one seems to agree on this, so I've got a solution. If you have a brand new business, you've never sold anything to anyone, you just have this idea in your mind, then typically you're better off thinking about the people that you seek to serve. Those are going to be people that you may have been one in the past or that you resonate with or that you're currently a member of the group. And the reason is, is because the better that you're able to understand your target market and their pains and problems and fears and frustrations and all the things we're going to talk about in just a minute, the better you're going to be able to position your product or your service or your offer as the solution to their pains and problems. On the flip side, if you already have an existing business, you've been in business for any length of time, then the odds are good that you already have a number of different products or services or things that you're selling. So the key here is to be specific and strategic and selective and make sure that you're choosing the right offer with the best margins. That is the most fun to deliver. That has the highest potential for scalability. That's easy to sort of market and clearly describe. So to recap all of that, if you've got a new product or a new offer or something you're thinking of selling, do a little bit of market research, find the ideal segment of people that you can best serve, and then make sure that there's a match there. If you already have an existing business, the odds are good that you've been selling something. So find out what it is about that that makes it unique and then find the best people that you can continue to serve by 80-20ing your existing customers. Essentially taking a look at the top 20% of your customers. What are their commonalities, their traits? What do they sort of have in common? Where do they live? All of the things that we're gonna talk about in just a second when it comes to 
comes to market. All right, so that is our offer and that's gonna form the core of everything that we do from this point on. Everything is going to be in alignment with this offer. It's gonna be in service of this offer. Marketing is done and one, one single offer at a time. You may have a number of different things you can do or want to do, but that doesn't mean you wanna blast somebody with all of your different offers because it's going to lead to overwhelm and to confusion and to this sort of paralysis by analysis, not knowing what to do or how to do it and confused customers don't buy. So we start here. Okay, so now that you've got the offer in mind, the next thing that you need to do is move on to this section here, goals. Now here's the deal. When it comes to setting goals for your marketing, I'm not a stickler for making sure that you, you set exact specific measurable goals. Like we want to increase our cost of acquisition or decrease our cost of acquisition by 3% or increase our leads by 22.8%. But I do need you to have a North Star, a guiding sort of area light to work towards to make sure that you're going on the right path rather than taking all of these completely irrelevant paths and ending up somewhere completely different that's not going to benefit you or your business or the people that you seek to serve. Good example here is that most business owners, most entrepreneurs, most marketers, sadly, they do marketing for the sake of marketing. They, they were told that, hey, we need to do some marketing. We need to make some stuff. So they make some stuff and then they put it out there and unsurprisingly, it doesn't resonate because it's just stuff. Or they may have the wrong kind of goal, which is creating stuff for the sake of getting likes or comments or shares rather than building a community and increasing engagement with the right kind of people that will lead to leads, that will lead to customers, that will lead to sales and revenue and actual business growth. Now, fortunately, when it comes to setting goals, the end goal is normally pretty simple. I mean, it's going to be an increase in sales or an increase in revenue. And then all you have to do is start to work your way backwards to assign relevant metrics and KPIs known as key performance indicators to make sure that everything is in alignment. For example, if you have a thousand dollar product to sell and you know that you sell it by phone and you close one and two sales. Well, now we figured out, well, we're going to need two sales calls to make one sale. And then, okay, well, how many leads do we need to generate in order to have those two sales calls? And then how many clicks do we need to get those leads? And you can start to work your way back. And at least it gives you sort of a right direction to move towards. Okay, next up, we are going to draw the line. And this one is all about target market. Target market, possibly the most important element in all of marketing. In fact, the word marketing, right? We've got market baked right into it. That's how important this is. They are the core, the central component of your entire campaign, the entire structure. Everything you do is about your target market and what's in service to them. You see, the reality is, is that when it comes to marketing, the customer doesn't buy when they understand, they buy when they feel understood. And that's all about empathy. It's about awareness. It's about being able to put yourself in their shoes, to view things from their perspective. See, the reason that a lot of marketing doesn't work, doesn't connect with the target market, Market is because it's not relevant. It's not, it doesn't resonate with them. They don't understand how this would apply to them. And so they just tune it out. Good example here. If you've ever seen a commercial or a YouTube ad or a Facebook ad or any kind of ad or marketing material at all, and you've thought, this is really dumb. Like seriously, this makes no sense. I don't even know what they're trying to sell. And if you do happen to figure out what they're trying to sell, you think, what a dumb product. Who would ever buy that? And here's the thing. The product, the service, whatever it is being sold might not be dumb. And the ad might actually be really really good but you're not the target market. Now, sure, their targeting could be off. I don't know why you're seeing the ad that's not meant for you. Sometimes these things happen. But the point of the matter is, is that as long as you're specific and relevant to the right kind of people, you will get them to take action. They will be inspired to want to get the solution to the problem that they have, provided that you've properly articulated this, that you've said the right words in the right way at the right time. On the other hand, if you water down your message by trying to appeal to everybody out there, it becomes very bland and very boring and very generic. And then people just automatically tune it out. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Talking about the things or the ads, the marketing that says we provide better service or faster delivery or we're superior or whatever it is. First of all, these are not specific terms. They're very ambiguous. They could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Second of all, pretty much everybody can say them. Therefore, everybody does say them. Therefore, they mean nothing. Anyway, I'm going to dive into more of the specifics on that in just a second. But first, let's figure out your ideal target market, your ideal customer avatar, also sometimes known as an ICA. And to do that, we break it down into three different categories. The first of which is their demographic details. These are the stereotypical things you think of when you think of marketing and think of a target market. So age, gender, income, occupation, titles, all of the things that are just like the generic customer avatar right there. 
Then we have geographic details. What city, state, province, country, uh, principality, municipality, neighborhood, where do they live basically? This is incredibly important because there's going to be cultural differences between not only different countries, but also different cities and sometimes even different neighborhoods in different cities. And then of course you have the mother of all the psychographic details. What are their values, their attitudes, their lifestyles, their beliefs, what organizations are they a part of, religious affiliations, political leanings, all of that stuff. All of the things that are not polite to talk about around the dinner table, those are the things that you want to know. You want to get into their head and you want to know kind of like what do they really think about these things that we're not supposed to talk about. Now I'm not suggesting you make all of your ads and all of your marketing directly call this stuff out, but it still is important to keep in the back of your mind when you're creating your marketing materials. What are these people going to like? What are they not going to like? What are they going to find offensive? And what is going to be polarizing, but in a good way that's gonna draw them in and really reject and repel everybody else that you just don't wanna deal with. After target market, well, of course, we have to drill down into those psychographic details even more. And to do that, we're going to sort of break apart their miracles and miseries. Now, miracles and miseries are things that I've coined that essentially make up the two different areas of your target market. Their miseries being their fears and problems and pains and frustrations and nightmares and all the things they're trying to get away from. And their miracles being all of their wants and dreams and goals and desires and aspirations and all the things that they're trying to move towards. Every person, every target market, every business has a way to appeal to someone's miseries as well as to their miracles. There's going to be different industries that lean one way more than another, there's going to be segments of the market that lean more one way or another. In other words, if you use messaging that helps someone move away from pain, sometimes that's stronger. On the other hand, you have more aspirational language helping someone achieve something and different markets are gonna benefit more from that. A decent mix of both is usually the best path. We don't want to constantly be negative and say, this is a horrible thing and you need to get it fixed and blah, blah, blah. Otherwise you kinda come off as a Debbie Downer. On the other hand, if all you're promising is rainbows and sunshine and unicorns and all the magical things in this world, well, they're not gonna have any reason to take action if you don't sort of back that up with a little bit of pain. In other words, a solution without a problem is completely meaningless. You need to put the solution in context to an actual problem that they have. Now, here's where things get good. The miracles and miseries essentially form a gap, a gap between where they're at right now with all of the bad stuff going on and where they want to be with all of the good stuff that they'd like to have. And it's your marketing's job to help them bridge that gap away from miseries and towards miracles. And the better you're able to communicate that and show how if you do these things, if you acquire this product, if you use this service, if you take me up on this offer, you're going to be able to have it. Well, the better you're able to clearly communicate that, the better all of your marketing and all of your sales are going to be. All right, moving on. Next up, we have present and active. Now, this one is a bit of a, a pet peeve of mine. I've got a few different marketing pet peeves, one of which is when I ask someone who their target market is and they say everyone or everyone in the world or people with money. And of course, as we've already covered, you can't be that broad. Otherwise, you end up with completely boring and bland and irrelevant messages. The other pet peeve I have is when people, business owners, entrepreneurs, marketers occasionally, hear about a new platform or a new social media channel or a new marketing opportunity, and they dive right in without doing all of the things that we've just covered, all of the more important things that need to happen first, identifying the model, figuring out the target market, working out their miracles and miseries, and all of those details. Instead, they just dive headfirst into this new platform, they make a bunch of stuff, nothing works, and then they swear off the platform for good. Well, unsurprisingly, the reason this doesn't work for most people most of the time is because this may be the completely wrong platform for you, for your business. Your people might might not even be there. You're marketing in what I call the marketing wasteland, an area that is completely devoid of potential prospects and customers and leads for your business. Much better alternative to identify your ideal target market, figure out their demographic details like age, gender, income, occupation, and then match it up with what social media platforms appeal to that demographic. Fortunately, this is not secret knowledge. All you have to do is head over to Google and type in social media demographics. You'll get a long list of different resources and it'll start linking up men between the ages of this and this are on this platform and women between the ages of this and this are on this platform and this platform appeals to these kind of people. It changes all the time, but there are a few pretty safe bets. For example, if you're in the business to business community, you're selling to other businesses, LinkedIn is kind of a staple. If you're serving a demographic that's 35 or 40 and older, Facebook is still probably your best bet. If on the other hand, most of your customers are 35, 30, 25 perhaps, we're looking at Instagram. TikTok being the new kid on block does skew younger, but like all social media platforms, 
platforms, all platforms in general, it is aging up and doing so relatively quickly. So you can find people there, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and it's continuing to age up. Twitter still skews slightly younger and a little more urban. Pinterest still primarily women. YouTube does tend to be kind of neutral territory for all people looking for all things. There is a kicker that you need to make video content, of course, more on that in a minute. And then of course, there's others that are popular in different countries, uh, different Reddit forums, different WhatsApp groups, Snapchat, if your demographic is much younger, lots of options, too many options. That's why people get confused. See all these options. They think they need to be on all of them. The reality is you're much better off to choose the one or maybe two different platforms where your ideal target market is present and active and then go there ignoring everything else. So let's draw our line and move on. So now that we figured all that out, the next thing that we need to do is we've got to figure out what kind of content are we going to make? And that leads us to content type. Now, what I'm gonna suggest here is that we need to establish a content type that you're going to start with. This may ultimately be or not be where you end up. We're gonna talk about that more in a minute as well. Lots of cliffhangers and open loops in this video. So keep watching. The point is though, is that there is a lot to unpack and where we're gonna start is going to be different than where we end up because I'm gonna give you a couple different options, but some are significantly superior to others. So here's what you've got. You've got text-based content, you've got audio content, and you've got video content. Arguably, you also have some kind of visual graphical content like uh, infographics and visual diagrams and things like that, but typically they're paired with one of the other kinds of content. You also have different lengths of content, short form and long form content. My suggestion is that pretty much every business out there needs one form of long form content, and then you can do whatever short form content you like to feed into it. So long form content for text is obviously a blog. Long form content for audio is a podcast, and long form content for video would be YouTube. Short form content though, we're talking about short tweets, we're talking about short captions for Instagram, we're talking about Facebook posts, we're talking about LinkedIn posts, anything like that for text. Audio is a little trickier, we're still kind of looking at mostly podcasts, possibly shorter ones, or taking clips and adding video elements to them. And then short form video is kind of the rage right now. Short form vertical video, we're looking at Instagram reels, we're looking at YouTube shorts, we're looking at TikTok. So if you don't mind writing, you can start with text. If you don't mind speaking, you can do audio. And if you don't mind doing video or getting in front of a camera, finding someone that's willing to get in front of a camera, video is by far the best one. But again, we'll talk about that in a minute. So we'll get our arrow there and then let's do our next one, which is mandatory marketing, no exceptions. Every business needs to use this, it's email. Yeah, I know, hoping for something a little sexier myself, but the fact is, is that email works. It works just as well now, if not better than it ever has before, because everybody uses email. I use email, you use email, your customers use email, your doctor, your accountant, your lawyer, everybody that you know has an email address. Not everybody has a social media account. Not everybody accepts SMS or text message marketing or even appreciates it. Direct mail is still phenomenally effective, but it's hard to find curated lists, especially for cost-effective prices. And it's a slightly more advanced and complicated marketing strategy that I wouldn't suggest starting out with, but everybody has email. Bit of a fun fact here, but when I'm working with a brand new business, I'm doing any kind of consulting or teaching, one of the very first things I do, if not the first thing I do, is take a look at their overall email marketing strategy. If they don't have a good one, we'll install one. If they have one that's working okay, we'll upgrade it. And I kid you not, every single time we're able to make substantial and significant increases in profitability, in customer retention, in the number of sales made. It's just, it's as close to a magic bullet as we have. So where do you even get started? Well, the very first thing you need is some kind of a lead magnet, also known as a bribe or a freebie or a content upgrade, essentially something that you can give away in exchange for a customer's email address so that they're actually enticed to join your list. I have an example of this that you can check out in the descriptions below or by visiting adamerhart.com slash chichi. This is my version of a freebie of an opt-in guide to get onto the list. Alternatively, you can offer your more supportive, more loyal customers and people that are interested in your business a way to join your newsletter directly, kind of bypassing the freebie, which does tend to attract a more loyal subscriber, but your conversion rates are going to be lower because you're not necessarily offering something of immediate value in return. For an example of this, you can visit adamerhart.com slash newsletter. From there, you need to decide on your email frequency, how often you're going to be emailing your list, whether it's once a week or three times a week. Some people email daily. I've done it in the past. I've kind of found a sweet spot around three to four times a week. Once a week is like your bare minimum. Once every two weeks is unacceptable. Once a month, and I don't even know why you have an email list. I mean, seriously, let's just run the math for a second. If an email open rate is say 30% for your list and you're emailing once a month, well, it could be months 
else before anybody sees you. And then when they finally do get your email, they've forgotten who you are. So they're likely to A, unsubscribe or B, worse, mark it as spam and just delete the whole thing. Also, depending on which statistic or study you read, marketing via email has been reported to provide somewhere between a 3,800% and 4,400% ROI or return on investment. I don't know if my numbers are right around there, but they wouldn't be too far off. It's, it's that good. Long story short, email, you gotta do it. Okay, moving on to the next one. Essentially, once you've got some of these pieces in place, it's time to start putting things together. And that comes in the form of a marketing funnel, also known as a sales funnel, also known as a customer journey, or just a funnel. Aptly named because it kind of looks like a funnel with a whole bunch of people coming in at the top and then kind of getting sorted out as they go through the bottom with fewer customers coming out the bottom. And this is a reminder that most won't. I first heard this from Frank Kern who said, most won't. In other words, most people won't click, most people won't subscribe, most people won't buy, and you need to factor that into your marketing and plan accordingly. But this is totally okay because most won't, but enough will, provided you do things right. Now, what a marketing funnel is really about is mapping out the customer journey, taking someone who has no idea who you are and walking them through all of the steps in order to become a lifelong and loyal customer, a brand ambassador, someone that loves you, loves what you do, wants to tell everyone about just how great you are, and you are pretty great. Now, the opposite of having a marketing funnel is just having nothing. I don't know what the opposite of a funnel would be. Like a, like a plate, you just pour stuff on, it splashes everywhere. Sadly, most people have marketing plates. In other words, they just take all of the traffic and all of the leads and they just dump them somewhere, typically on their homepage. Meaning that someone shows up at your website's homepage, they have no idea what they're doing, they don't know where to go, they might click the contact button, but there's a weird form and they don't know if they wanna do that yet because they just met you and it's, it's kinda pushy. Let's slow down here. So they kind of skirt around a little bit and then they bounce, which is marketer term for leave and never come back. Again, depending on what statistic you use, the vast majority of visitors to a website that click the back button never return, somewhere around the range of 98 to 99%. Where are they going, you might ask? And well, let me tell you, they're going to your competitors that actually have a funnel. Something that says, hey, you're new here. Let's start here. Let me give you this thing. Let me nurture you and provide you some value. Let me follow up, see if you have any questions. And let me continue offering you the next step in the process in order to becoming a customer. Now, the best advice that I can offer in a short period of time when it comes to mapping out your marketing funnel is to start at the end like we did with your goals and then reverse engineer the process. So in other words, for someone to make a sale, well, what needs to happen before that? Maybe it's visit a sales page. Okay, well, what needs to happen before they visit a sales page? It's like, okay, well, they need to click a link. Okay, well, what needs to happen for them to click a link? Are they getting it through content or through email? And then if they got on your email, how are they getting on your email? And essentially, you can just work your way backwards through the process and then once it's all mapped out, that's where things get really exciting. Yeah, I'm kind of nerdy about this stuff. Because once it's mapped out, now you can start looking for gaps, for leaks in your funnel. You can start finding areas where you're losing people through some random mistake or messaging that just doesn't quite line up. For example, if everybody's clicking over to your sales page, but nobody's opting in or nobody's buying, well, now we know we have a conversion issue on the sales page. On the other hand, if people are joining your email list, but then never opening any of your emails, well, now we know we have an issue issue with congruence between what was promised and what's being delivered, or perhaps we're just collecting bad emails. Or if we map it all the way out and we get to the sales call and we realize that we're only closing one in four or one in five, when we should be closing one in three or one in two, well now we know we can start looking at that and we can look at all of the steps up to it. And was there a congruence issue again? Were there pricing expectations? Were there other objections and sales issues that we could have overcome in our marketing prior? What's really cool about this is that we make a small tweak over here and we we increase conversions by 2% and we increase that one by 3% and that one by 1%. Well, it's not like we're adding these things up just one after another, they compound. So an increase by 3% here could lead to 10 or 20 or 30 more sales, which could then lead to thousands or tens of thousands or even millions more dollars in revenue at the end. Speaking of revenue, next step here after our funnel is CLV, which stands for Customer Lifetime Value, sometimes referred to as uh, LTV for Lifetime Value or LCV for Lifetime Customer Value. Whatever it is, it's pretty much all the same thing, which what is the value of a customer to your business over their lifetime? 
period. Now, some people look at this in revenue, some people look at it in profit. I typically like to look at it in profit, but it depends on the formula that we're looking at. The point is, if you've never done this before, this is an incredibly powerful exercise to run through to figure out just how valuable someone is to your business. And I'm willing to bet, regardless of what business or market or industry you're in, it's significantly higher than you thought, which means that you now have permission to do significantly more marketing and invest in significantly more content because you know just how profitable and how valuable new customers and new clients and new sales are for your business. So that's step one, figure out what is your CLV. After that, you need to find ways to encourage and increase retention. The number of clients and customers that you're going to keep, the length of time that you're going to keep them, and then finding other ways to increase that customer lifetime value, either by selling them more things, by selling them more things more often, by increasing the price, by providing upsells and downsells and cross-sells, essentially other ways and other opportunities to solve problems that they have. And that's an important point to make here. What we're doing with our marketing and with our offers is we're solving problems that they have. And when we solve a big enough problem, we're rewarded in direct proportion to the value of the problem we solve. This is why some people make a whole lot of money. It's because they solve big problems. And some people struggle to make any money at all because they're just not solving enough problems for enough people, or they're not solving big enough problems for enough people. Okay, so that is CLV. And what you may notice is that is kind of the final ring of our concentric expanding circles, right? moving all the way out, but we still have one left. And the reason that I almost didn't want to give it a ring of its own, but rather have it sort of circle the whole thing is because especially today, especially now and moving into the future, it's so important that it almost needs to overlap and encompass everything else that we're doing. This is going to support all of the marketing of your offer. It's going to help move you towards your goals faster than you ever thought. It's appealing to every target market. More people consume this kind of content than any anything else. It basically checks the box for being able to clearly articulate Miracle's miseries. It works with almost every single platform, which means we can put it in front of people and where they're present and active online. It's the best content type. We can embed it in email. It works as part of the funnel, so on and so forth. Probably no surprise here that the final piece of the puzzle is video. Essentially, the big question that you want to ask yourself here is how can you supercharge everything you're doing with a video marketing strategy? Now, clearly for long form video, YouTube is the best place to do it. That said, I appreciate that if you've never done video marketing before, if you're just getting started, you're not comfortable in front of a camera, that's a pretty big ask. So we can put that on the back burner for now. And there are a lot smaller and somewhat still very effective steps that you can take leading up to this inevitable conclusion. Number one, start with stories, grab your phone, Look into it, hit record, go live for like 15 or 30 seconds and share some kind of valuable tip or insight or story or something that's going on. Very low barrier, no editing required, raw and authentic will beat overly produced and polished every single day of the week. If you feel like taking it up a step further, do more of them. Once, twice, three, four times even a day isn't a bad strategy. You can do them on Instagram, you can do them on Facebook, you can do them on a number of different platforms as well, depending on subscriber counts and what rules are coming and going. But stories are a great way to sort of dip your toes into the water and get started. Next, if you're willing to take it that next step further and you want to capitalize on all of the available organic reach right now, short form vertical content is still going to be your best bet. These are things like Instagram Reels and TikTok and YouTube Shorts. The length of these varies. Different platforms tend to have preferences for different length videos, but typically we're looking at 15 to 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds, somewhere around that range. So what's something that you can talk about for 30 to 60 seconds? I'm willing to bet that if you've been in business for any length of time or you have any sort of passion or interest in what you're doing, there's a lot of stuff that you could share that other people would be interested in hearing about. Of course, if you really want to dominate your space, become the leader in your industry, then YouTube is clearly going to be the winner here for long form video content. So don't be afraid to test it out. Upload a few bad videos at first. I mean, the beauty of just getting started is nobody's really around to watch your stuff. So you get a chance to sort of practice and experiment a little bit without all the judgment of the internet. Looking back on my first videos, they were awkward and incredibly sweaty and I was super nervous and I didn't know how to use a camera, so it's kind of blurry. And I didn't know how to use a microphone, so it only came out of one side. Yeah, it was it was rough. But the point is, is that practice does make progress and you've got to start somewhere in order to get better. All that said, there are still seven more tactics and strategies and tricks and hacks that I didn't have a chance to get to in this video. So that's why I've linked up a video right here with seven of the most proven and effective marketing strategies for you to take a look at right now. So make sure to hop in there and I'll see you in the next video. Understanding the seven things that I'm gonna be walking you through here today will allow you to immediately upgrade all of it, get better results, more clicks, more traffic, more sales from everything you do. 